Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, maybe. Welcome, everybody. We are um, collecting folks here from the waiting room. Um, I'm Kelly Murray. I'm with the Consortium for Service Innovation. Thanks for joining us. Let me turn off the waiting room for a minute here and people will collect. Is that a safe choice, Kelly? Sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. I, uh, Adam likes to tease us because we got Zoom bombed a couple weeks ago, but now I know where the button is <coughs> to suspend participant activities. So if for some reason everything oh. goes quiet, that's what has happened. <laughs> <laughs> We're all suffering from a little bit of trauma around that. That was, a, that was quite a surprise. Very. It, it felt like we made the big time, right? That we we got a we were popular enough to get some random Zoom bomb. So, welcome. This is a consortium conversation. We have these um, occasionally around topics of interest to consortium members, and we'll talk about that in just a second. My name is Kelly Murray. I'm the um, Chief Engagement Officer. I'm here today with Matt Seaman, who's our Executive Director, and Jill and Arnfin are on the phone. They are on our staff as well. Um, Jill is our Operations Director. Arnfin is the um, head, the Global Head of the KCS Academy. We're also joined today by Sarah Feldman, who's with Fast Spring, and by Andy Koopmans, who's with F5. Um, we're going to talk today about um, sort of the intersection of knowledge management and content management or content strategy. Um, I'm going to, one of the things that we talk about in KCS is that context is as important as content. And so I have just a couple of slides because I want to set some context around what KCS is. Um, and the way that we look at uh, and talk about customer success. And then I hope that the rest of our time together can be a conversation about these topics. Um, so let me share my screen. Do um, jump in uh, whenever, whenever you'd like to. Um, with any, any questions or comments. So we wanna talk a little bit about um, how we can best share, leverage, uh, and, well, ca and capture organizational memory. And then um, a little bit about knowledge is the great enabler. So we'll get into that a little bit. So the Consortium for Service Innovation, if you're joining us because of Sarah's and Bonnie's podcast, um, Meaningful Content Mixer, thank you. It's lovely to have you with us. Um, the Consortium uh, is a not-for-profit industry association. We have a group of member companies who innovate around the customer experience, but we grew up in customer support. So we've been around for about 25 years. Um, the consortium staff, which is just five of us, uh, kind of collects the experience of the members and publishes that in, in a set of best practices. Uh, most of our content is offered with um, right to use with attribution under a Creative Commons license. Um, and, and the way we gather that is through the experience of the members. So we, we host meetings like this where we have conversations about um, uh, topics of interest. And then when we kind of figure out something that works real well, we capture it and publish it. This is just a um, collection, a, a small collection of our about 60 member companies. Um, and we, while we are gathering more members in, who are working in lots of different spaces, um, our, our largest focus for the longest period of time has been um, high tech customer support. But these are the folks who are continuing to evolve the methodologies that we talk about, which are, loosely organized into these sort of five areas. So knowledge-centered service or KCS is the most baked of our methodologies. Um, it is a, a way in which we uh, capture, structure, and share um, information specifically um, support knowledge through what we call articles. That's where our focus has been um, over the last 25 years. Uh -huh. um, what has come out of that uh, is that knowledge-centered service ends up being great for helping people push known issues to delivering that through self-service. And um, once you get really good at that, you have to <clears throat> figure out how to get really good at solving new issues. Um, so intelligent swarming was sort of born out of the fact that we've put some inadvertent maybe uh, barriers up to collaborating in our organizations and intelligence forming really looks to help make collaboration um, very 
uh, efficient. I'm gonna look at, I just wanna do the mute button. There we go. So, um, oh, let me go back. Um, predictive customer engagement is all about how, when we know things that our customers would should know or would be helpful for them to know, um, but they don't know to ask us for it, how can we be predictive in, in offering that, um, that information to them? Um, which all of those things sort of wrap up into the customer experience initiative, which is really looking at the uh, customer experience as a whole and what we what we can do in each of those touch points to provide a cohesive customer experience. And when we do all these things, um, the way we approach leadership ends up changing some. So when we really are talking about an adaptive organization and um, empowering and motivating our people to do the right thing based um, sort of on a set of guardrails, um, it requires a different set of leadership practices than perhaps we've used um, in the past in a more command and control structure. Um, we need to really think about how we're gonna influence a network versus manage a hierarchy. So that's kind of what the that, that piece of our work is around. KCS um, at, its, at its very heart is really seeking to create content that is findable and usable by an intended audience. So this is a very rich methodology. Um, we, have a, we have a practices guide that is about 250 pages long at this point, includes all the best things we know about um, how to do KCS. Right now, it's specifically focused on how to do KCS in customer support. Um, and so when we talk about, uh, generally, when we talk about findable and usable by an intended audience, we're talking about people who are coming to us um, requesting answers to specific questions. Um, when we talk about it being uh, findable and usable, we, we, we spend a lot of time talking about um, how to structure that for the context of the people who are coming to, to use it. And, and we'll get into this a little bit more um, in just a couple minutes, but the intended audience um, has some implications about how the content might be structured or presented or its level of formality. Um, so we'll talk about that as well, but. The other thing that KCS does um, and the KCS practices do is give us insight into the customer experience because we're looking at how this intended audience is using um, the content that we are, we are providing them. So we often talk about the benefits of KCS um, falling into these sort of three buckets, if you will. Um, the first thing that we see when, when people implement KCS is operational efficiency, because we have an opportunity to, um, hang on. Matt, are you, I think you are set up as a co-host. If you can um, just, keep an eye on the mute button, that would be awesome. Oh, I'm, I'm oh, pressing right. all the wrong buttons. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, operation efficiency. So we once we um, get good at capturing and publishing information, we are, get to share uh, our experience with our colleagues and then um, sort of realize benefit number two is we can get that information to the people who are looking for it um, in a way that they can find it without contacting us. Step three, in terms of organizational improvements, once we have a sense of um, what people are doing and what people are using, uh, we, can, we can start removing some of those hiccups and issues from the environment. So um, we are looking for people to make some kind of connection between here's the question that's being asked and here's the question that's being answered. And once we get some insight into that, that connection and how often those answers are being served, we can do all kinds of things within our organizations to remove that um, issue from being asked, right? We're removing that hiccup from that customer experience. And the way that we do that um, when in using KCS, uh, we call uh, folks who engage in any kind of knowledge behavior and knowledge worker. And we want them to do four things. And I have, I've rearranged um, this list. We, do, we often talk about it in a different order, but ultimately what we really wanna do is have our knowledge workers help us make that connection between the question being asked and the question and the answer being served. So in, 
support, this is usually a case or an incident, and we link a knowledge article to that. And that's what give it, gives us the data and the insights to take action on what's happening and, and a, a clear picture of the customer experience. We also want them to improve the knowledge that they interact with. Um, so in case, yes, there's a licensing model, um, people, uh, and by that, it's what I mean is more like a driver's license, not like a software license. So people learn how to do things and get um, uh, permissions in the system to do things when they have, have demonstrated mastery of that. So when we ask people to improve things, uh, we either want them to flag it if, uh, if they are not allowed to fix it yet, or we just want them to fix it. Um, we we want to put our knowledge articles in a little bit of a structure um, that helps with readability, readability and findability. Um, it helps with harvesting some, some of those things for um, uh, machine learning and AI types of things. And then there is a period of time when we want our knowledge workers to really be capturing things. And that's usually very early on in um, most of our capture, I'd say, happens quite early on in a KCS implementation because there are a lot of questions that we end up answering over and over again. I think we spend a lot of time really focused on, oh my gosh, we're going to ask knowledge workers to be writers. And it turns out that's not going to be the majority of their job, right? We're, we're really asking them to take notes on new um, uh, in, uh, new problems as they come across them. And otherwise, it's doing a lot of reusing or adding some, some context or improving um, those things or flagging them for something, someone else to do that. And the way um, that we get knowledge workers to do these behaviors, um, it really requires a lot of understanding and buy-in. So we need folks to, uh, we need to have a, a specific and thoughtful approach around our leadership. We offer coaching um, in a KCS implementation around learning how to do some of these uh, new, new tasks sometimes. This is all part of the learning model of KCS. The licensing and certification, making sure that people um, are on a path where they can level up in terms of their skills. Um, and, then, and then having to focus on the tools and infrastructure that we use um, all helps drive these knowledge worker behaviors, which drive these realized benefits. And the other thing that we talk about with KCS is it, it's a methodology that's wholly beneficial. So the stakeholders for KCS, we talk about as being the organization, and here's a handful of things that this is this is just a partial list. We have a much longer list in some of our documentation around um, the things that KCS enables for each of these stakeholders. But the organization gets benefit from this methodology. We talk about requesters who are just the people who are asking questions. Um, it, in lots of cases, it's a customer. In some cases, it's an internal customer. Um, and then we talk about responders who are people who are answering questions. And sometimes requesters and responders switch roles, right, depending on, on what our organization is, um, looks like. So the organization really benefits from looking at these patterns and trends and being able to affect the entire customer experience. Um, requesters can get their answers faster when we, when we have the people, when we have the, re the responders who are interacting with the requesters, um, capturing and publishing knowledge in the context of the people who are asking the question, then the people who are asking the question can the next people can get that information um, with much less effort. Um, and responders have a sense of not being out alone in the world um, answering questions, right? They have, a, they have a place where they can go and, a, and a, a methodology that their peers are sort of adhering to so that they can share uh, organizational knowledge and that is um, uh, independent of space and time. Over these 25 years, um, the methodology has really uh, developed into quite a rich set of, of um, guidelines. Um, I hesitate to use the word rules, but we do, uh, there are practices and techniques. These are the eight practices of the, of the KCS methodology. And underneath these, there are techniques to do it. Still, this is quite focused on um, a customer support or a, sort of an IT desk kind of um, situation. I think there's a lot of opportunity to, to amend this or to um, interpret it in ways where it might fit in, in different um, places in our organization as we talk about how we kind of deal with um, corporate or organizational memory. Um, it is, uh, it's a double loop model, so it is self-correcting. 
There are lots of places where we um, want to pause and reflect on how the system is working. Um, and I think that's all I want to say about that, because that there's lots of other things that we could say about the details of um, how KCS works, but this is kind of the, the basic structure. Um, and, and so I want to talk just for a minute about how we think about customer success, because there's a there's a divide, I think, between what we are talking about right now and actually the discipline of customer success, um, where I think that that perhaps we could, there could be a, a partnership between those two things, or we could reconcile um, some of those things. But when when we talk about creating value um, in a support organization, one of the this has been a conversation that's been going on for um, quite a while as we've kind of thought through what this means in terms of um, differentiating our support uh, organizations from others, right? So the being able to deal with a break fix is kind of that, that first barrier of entry. That's the first thing that we have to do um, when if we are creating value for our organizations as a support um, entity. If we can move up this value stack, right? The, as we go up the value stack, we are creating more value, um, I think both for the organization, for our company and for our customers. <clears throat> if we can do some things that predict and prevent um, customer issues from arising, that's that's getting pretty interesting. If we can really focus on customer success, our customer success and productivity, that's that's kind of the whole goal, right? This is this is where we really get into being able to um, uh, help people. Uh, in, we increase customer loyalty. Um, we improve the customer experience, and then. Many of us are in a scenario where we could really be focused on our customers' customer success. So lots of lots of our members are um, B two B organizations, and so it's starting to really think through what are the things that we can do that would make our customers' customers successful is is the top of this stack as we talk about it now, and the things that help us move up this stack, the things that we have to have within our organization, um, which. KCS influences all of these things, right? This this level of trust. If we can if we can build a level of trust with our um, with our customers, uh, that's the only way that we can start moving up this value stack. Um, knowing about our customers and what their business is, so having a little bit of business acumen around uh, the things that they are working on and what are their this is really about their context, right? And what's important to them. The know me factor, so having a sense of who's who's calling, who's asking the question, how how do they have to start, uh, you know, by by starting with the chat bot, or do they have a phone number that they can call directly to us when they have an issue because we we know who they are and they know who we are, and then this idea of co-creation that we can we can develop all of the most amazing services in the world for our customers, but if it's not something that they are interested in, if not, if it's not something that helps them attain their goals, um, that, that that's uh, the uptake there is not going to be uh, what we think it should be. Um, so, so being in conversation um, with customers about the things that they really want and about the experience that they're really having um, is another thing that helps us head up this value stack. Matt, I saw you just go off camera, but I was going to ask you if there's anything else you wanted to say about the value stack here. And I'm guessing he had to step away, so we'll come back to Matt. <laughs> so the the one last piece of context here before um, before we sort of move to a conversational more format is this content continuum. So traditionally. Um, KCS has dealt with just a specific part of this content continuum that exists within our organization. So, um, and Matt and I were talking about this yesterday about this, this feels maybe like a model that we could revisit, um, that, that things are perhaps shifting here. But when we think about sort of the, the, the spectrum of things, of content types that we have in our organizations, we kind of move from this informal or dynamic um, types of things. Conversations used to be, um, you know, running into each other at the water cooler that, uh, you know, now maybe it's actually just conversations on Slack. Um, it's sort of all the way through these formal published um, product manuals or whatever, whatever the sort of the thickest piece of 
um, documentation is uh, that it, that ends up being you know static or harder to change. And, and usually we talk about KCS as sitting in this um, space where it, it really is about sort of knowledge articles. It's about just-in-time content. It's about answering questions as they're asked. Um, so their, their interactions or incidents, right? We have, our, we have the question being asked. We have the knowledge being captured. Um, sometimes those might go influence policy and process based on the experience that we are um, seeing with, with that incident and that relationship to knowledge. Um, but it feels like so. So this is the this is the evolve loop output, right? Where we're looking at um, trends and sort and patterns, and then helping to um, amend some of the more static things. But it feels like perhaps um, there are greater opportunities for a KCS like um, or a KCS influenced um, style of content interaction as we as we are able to sort of have more uh, direct influence and thinking about things, things end up being easier to publish now. It used to be, you know, we were actually going to send something off to the publishing house and now we have a lot more opportunities to um, update on the, on the fly as it were. So um, that is what I had in terms of context setting. Are there questions that I can answer now? And I'd love to hear um, from Sarah specifically about sort of some of the opportunities that you see or you've been thinking about. So Sarah is at FastSpring and is a KCS certified trainer and has been um, playing with us in the KCS space from a, from, for a long time, but also came from a world of tech writing and content management. And so I think you have had some thoughts about how we how we deal with this or how or, or what some interesting intersections might be yeah well um the the last thing you shared just sparked a thought for me in the context of customer success conversations of course is on that content continuum i i think that the items on the right the more formal items i think what we're not seeing represented there is customer success type content, success content uh, more generally. So things like examples and use cases, um, content like this is often talked about in terms of like a maturity model of how are we helping our customers level up in their experience with our product or service. Um, and another thing would be related to like onboarding. Bonnie and I actually talk about onboarding a lot because I mm. think it's a, it's a concrete example that a lot of folks can really relate to in, in terms of how this sort of knowledge exchange is v valuable, um, sharing between internal teams and then of course directly to end users. And then just this morning, I was thinking about this before we hopped on um, and the term upboarding popped into my head. So it's, I think we could all take the idea of onboarding and think about, well, how could we transpose that to more of like an upboarding <laughs> experience uh, later on in the journey? And I want to specifically call that out as distinct from an upsell, because mm. I think we often just think about onboarding, okay, the customer gave us some money, and we're going to help them realize value from that money. Now we're upselling them again. It's almost a re-onboard when you're upselling someone, right? Because it's kind of tied to um, a specific transaction. But I think kind of the gray area in between that we're not quite sophisticated enough yet when it comes to making this all work better is kind of that that upboarding, to use my new made up fake term. Maybe <laughs> someone on the internet has already used it. I haven't Googled it to see if I'm the original thinker of it. Okay. But well, I think when it. you, what we liked about and what Kelly and I were talking about yesterday when we were talking about this meeting today, instead of thinking about content and knowledge is this kind of linear um, mm -hmm. thing. It really is a life cycle in its own. And if we think about it instead of the entire customer life cycle and what types of content, knowledge, information are needed at each part of a customer journey, if you're in the early sales cycle and you need marketing material and you need understanding of features and functions and the impacts that's very different than when you're talking to support about, I have a problem and 
are some of the KCS best practices or core concepts. They're very applicable to any type of content, at least we believe they are. But how do you map it to the right point in a life cycle of the you know layer model of landing, adopting, expanding, and renewing? And, and what types of content do you need? How do you create that content? How formal does it have to be? I don't like this discussion, I don't think we've had today of structured and unstructured content because KCS content is very structured content. It's not unstructured content. It just is more in the moment content, I would say. Um, but that, that mapping, I think, would be a fun exercise to do with some people that have a broad perspective on all those parts of a customer journey. Another thing that I was thinking about when I saw that model that uh, I think should probably change a little bit is, is the, the SaaS type offerings, the born in the cloud, um, you know, they're, they're so much more agile with, um, with content and, um, and it's just, it, it really is very dynamic. It's, it's not actually very static anymore because, because pro our products are that way and they're forced to be that way. So the, the static versus dynamic is, is a little bit of, of a conundrum because, because, uh, you know, so I think that, you know, KCS actually that, that bubble expands um, mm -hmm. and, and can really influence, like you were saying, Kelly is um, the, you know, that dynamic uh, changing, improving uh, into, and, and, and so, part of the improvements that we're talking about with product management and development that gets into, I think the, um, some of the documentation and content, different content types. Uh, so there's huge opportunities there. That was something I thought about. Thanks, Laurel. It's, it is funny to kind of come back to some of these things and be like, oh yeah, you can, sometimes you can tell where we started with this, which was right. in some cases before the web. Yeah, 25 like, years ago. Whoa, <laughs> <laughs> There's some, there are a couple of things here that I think we could probably get yeah. refreshed. Right. So. I just wanted to, to mention because we've, we've talked about customer journey and we've talked about customer success and my, most recent rollout with KCS has been at IFS and it's my third um, rollout of KCS. My video isn't working and I feel sad about that. I'm going to fix it in a minute. <laughs> but um, one of the things that, that got me thinking is right at the moment, my role at IFS originally sort of was a business transformationist. and I was the VP of business transformation working under customer success. And we've just created the customer success organization um, within the sort of sitting next to support and services. And so my new role encompasses addressing both kinds of content mm. and creating a voice of the customer program for the very first time at IFS. So my journey, when I thought about these two things that are hugely resource intensive to start with, I started from the point of view that I wanted to map the customer success life cycle, then create and understand what the customer journey looked like from that, figure out what the listening posts were going to be embedded in that journey, and then think about how to leverage the voice of the customer program to feed into the stuff that I was doing about KCS. So the way that I've designed both the KCS program and the voice of the customer program is they are mutually conducive to each other. And the outputs of those also feed into R&D and now R&D are weighing into both of these angles because they're understanding the value of all of those things. But one of the first, when I first sort of proposed that these were the, going to be my two rocks that I was going to work with, I was told knowledge and customer voice of the customers don't go together but what I'm hearing in here is that they actually you know this is not such a two silly things to put together I, I think they go directly together I mean you're talking about it, there's three organizations in a company that understand everything you need to know about the customer there's the sales team who understands the job the customer is trying to do 
there's the services team that understands all the problems customers are running into. And now you have this idea of customer success management, which they're building the playbook for how do I get a customer from that sales entry point through the really end of life of using our product or, and service. Think of all the knowledge and information those three groups are creating and how valuable that would be to your marketing team, your R&D team, everybody in the company. And then how do you pull all that information back out and get it reused in sales and get it reused in services? And I think what KCS does is it builds a framework that allows you to think through those things. But typically, as Kelly said in the intro, it's been so focused on the almost break fix model of saying, once we have a new issue, let's document it so we can move it to self-service. But really we could use those core concepts and expand it across all these different functions. Now, how do exactly. you do that, how do you do that uh, as a and our support organization is, is, is very well grounded. You know, those processes enabling KCS and support has been fairly easy. But when you have this brand new function that is sitting under the same umbrella where you're sitting and you're bringing in the voice of the customer piece at the same time. Mm-hmm. And we haven't even talked about communities. Mm-hmm. So community has become this place where, again, most of the audience that we have there is around technical questions. But we have this whole area of the business that are looking for their value add props, their their, uh, success plan templates, um, their best practice steps. All of these pieces of content are all of the pieces of content that I feel have to be addressed, which is why I was truly excited to see this particular webinar coming up this afternoon, because this is exactly what I'm living and breathing right now. I have a new organization. They've never done this job before. And whilst I've lived in these organizations for a really long time, it's the first time that all of these rocks have collided into one role. And Flavia, just to expand on on that with the communities, it's not just the break, fix and best practices, but many community tools now have ideas, uh, that functionality. So that's a great voice of customer where you enable that and you're getting ideas from your customers. Not So typically in a support, you'll get the, the bugs, but uh, in the communities with that ideas functionality, you get that great voice of the customer. And you can understand you know, their, their reputation and uh, yes. when they're bringing ideas. So communities is a, a critical part of that uh, customer journey that Kelly was talking about earlier. And uh, we've definitely seen that and embracing that as part of the, that uh, customer journey, so not just self-service, but the uh, the communities and social and uh, the agencies as well as proactive, et cetera. You know, if you, if you think about it, um, actually, there's another aspect of voice of the customer, and that's actually the usage of your materials. Um, so if you do an analysis on the usage of your materials, you see the pain points that customers have, and they're not even vocally saying anything to you they're actually saying something to you through their usage and so uh, what we're utilizing is uh, we're doing the analysis and that attributes directly to product improvement and then also our customer success team looks at what customers are encountering on a regular basis and building that into their customer success program proactively uh, because we know so many people run into issues. And so that's kind of, I kind of look at that as all part of voice of the customer, not just the direct interaction with the customer one-on-one type thing or, you know, surveys. Yeah. and, and so Most people, if you, if you said that knowledge was a listening post as a voice of the, as a traditional voice of the customer program, they'd look at you like you were crazy. But that's why I have these two pieces, because for me, the analytics that you get from KCS, all of that rich metadata that comes with, that it fills in that gap that a voice of the customer program can't always fill. And that's what isn't being said. Because if we think about Pareto law, and you know, you're only ever gonna get 20% of the surveys being filled in if you're lucky, it helps fill some of those, those spaces in between. And ideation in the community, that was, yeah, we, we just moved that over to community last week, So it didn't fall into another hole. So slowly but surely, not only do you create a customer journey and you map that out, but when you sit under this umbrella and you bring all of these pieces together through experience that you've had, you're creating that holistic ecosystem that's data driven 
and you've got the outputs, which is that you are continually able to serve and refresh the content that you're serving to the customer when they need it. Whilst back end, getting the data back from it so that you can concentrate on um, and help prioritize with R&D what needs to be the next thing that you fix. Yeah. And to I roll. freaking love it. Yeah. <laughs> so can I just pause you for one second, our friend? Yeah. Can, um, uh, Claudia, is, has there been a specific discipline or um, like role in your organization that, that is particularly uh, resistant to this idea? Um, so uh, IFS at ERP, and they are pretty prehistoric and they've been around for a long time. They are not a startup. And my previous life, I enabled KCS at Alfresco. And I've noticed with younger companies, they're more open to being open. Mm -hmm. um, these sort of more established organizations, I don't, I think R&D actually were the least resistant on this occasion mm -hmm. in the historically it's been most, but they are just so blind to, to understanding where prioritization can come from, both from the ideation side of things, which is why they've now come into community, but also just being able to understand we can't just prioritize from customers shouting the loudest. There has to be a better way, ideally before they shout. Um, for me, or, the organization that has been the most resistant is sales. And, and that is because I still feel like when you say knowledge centered service, it still feels like a thing that support do. When I start yeah. angling it from, thank you very much, Kelly and Sarah for your um, webinar on knowledge as a service. When I start talking about KCS as part of CAS and how we will enable our customer success managers with this kind of insight and feed it in with all of that readout. As soon as you mention knowledge as a service, then sales think it might be something that they can sell, that customers can instantly glean value from. And that turned the conversation around. Interesting. And I was going to point out, Laurel, you were mentioned earlier about in the cloud-based environment, we have so much insight now on the use of the products. So are they adopting the features? How long has it taken them to install and configure or go through the certain steps? And the company has an idea on what features should be used and how long the various steps should take. But now you have tremendous insight and more and more companies are looking at how to embed their service experience into actual product usage. So you have much more of the Kelly's point on uh, understanding the customer. If you understand if you tapped into what they're doing with the product and you have that insight, you can much better serve them. You become much more of a trusted advisor. Um, but that's a tremendous amount of insight into that, the customer usage that more and more customers are, are looking at in, uh, in their customer success to see, are, are they getting the value from that product? Not just uh, are they using self-service or the communities or contacting us for support, but really understanding the value that they're getting from the product. And then that helps you move up that, uh, that pyramid to be that trusted advisor. Yeah, and if that is part of your conversation as a customer success manager to back up the data, I see that this is the activity that's going on with the product and you couple that with the trusted advisor and, and you know helping them move i think that's that's huge value um for customer uh, customer success program in general so yeah so andy i wanted to ask you a little bit about your experience because you are a senior technical writer at f5 if i'm not mistaken is that still true yeah it, it as far as i know yeah Perfect. Okay. I, didn't, I wasn't sure if you had you know, been promoted. That was my assumption that you would no. have been because, you know, you're such a KCS advocate now. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your journey um, from, from being KCS resistant to, to being um, a KCS promoter. Sure. Uh, so I've been doing this kind of work for about 25 years. And, you know, when first started out, very different kind of environment you know the development is very separate from support or any sort of documentation um i started out with contracts at microsoft and whatnot and the uh field was very different in that you the idea was to create static 
uh, documentation that was ready to be published in a book because it's never going to be published again, you know, so you have to get it right and be very brushed up. And over, over time, the way we work has changed in that you can do, you know, revisions because the text is live and whatnot. Uh, however, I, I was resistant uh, to the KCS idea because, uh, well, you know, we, my team has worked very hard at making sure that the documentation was as good as we can make it, you know, very, very well, you know, adherent to style and our gra grammar and whatnot and all that. And I thought, oh my God, we're going to let a, a bunch of non-professional writers into our knowledge base and this is going to completely, you know, destroy it. And of course it doesn't. And one of the, 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 the things that are, that I find impressive about KCS is the the way it is able to mitigate that kind of issue by its structure of the articles with the templates that we, uh, are used for the various fields that makes it very easy for not only the engineer to fill out, but for the reader to understand where, you know, the context of what is going on with their reading. So you don't even need full sentences. You just need full, you know, thoughts. And um, I'm still an editor, you know, I still look at the, the, some of the documentation and I would change things because that would be my job. But the, the, the sufficient to solve uh, idea is is really radical because I think it makes it possible for people just to go in and find app answers very, very rapidly, allows many more people to contribute, which these days that is an absolute necessity for our company. For instance, we have just so many products and uh, you know, services that we are it would be impossible for you know the, the team of five writers that we have to keep up with all of that documentation and serve the, the customers properly. So I've really been impressed by the fact that the the NSC uh, our, our, our knowledge workers have been able to uh, contribute as as well as they have been. And certainly they make mistakes, but everyone makes mistakes. I mean, I've made five this morning probably. <laughs> so, but. Uh, uh, the the uh, knowledge getting out as to the customers quickly and getting you know just in time kind of answers is is vitally important and I have been able to balance my need to correct things <laughs> with my my realization uh, realization of that value and um, I'm also uh, doing some KCS coaching and that helps a lot because mm -hmm. I have a great amount of sympathy for people who are have difficulty translating their thoughts or what they're trying to do into uh, documentation. And that, that is uh, a role I really enjoy because I'm able to help engineers uh, with that product uh, process and to understand how KCS works. And uh, almost everyone I've talked to, once they really understand it, they really like it because it's, it's, so, uh, it's so flexible and yet it, you know, it shows it's not rigid, you know, even though there's a template, it's, it gives you this this uh, palette to or, or this canvas on which to to put your your knowledge very rapidly and get it out. So uh, I think I've gone on more than I need to. <laughs> are, are there are there types of content at F five that you are responsible for that are different than knowledge articles at this point? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So we have um, the knowledge articles, and uh, the editors don't really touch those. So we have more things like compliance based um, documentation, which includes manuals, policies, and uh, things like that. They tend to be longer, more complicated. Some of them have to be approved by executive teams, things like that, and. You know, we need to keep that locked down because there's legal issues there. Yeah. So yes, we I, I, we do handle that. And I was going to yeah. also add the the video content um, that that you've been a part of, and that's been a a really fun transformation to see the tech writers um, move into video editing and production. And I mean, it, it was a, a perfect uh, path. Uh, for them to, you know, to do that. And it's, it's been hugely successful. The, uh, the engagement that we have from customers on videos um, has just skyrocketed in, in the last year, I would say. So, um, so that's been really fun to see how they, because I do think that there was fear um, on the team of, you know, am I, you know, going to be out of a job soon because I, you know, because the compliance content is less, you know, than, but, um, but 
but no, <laughs> we actually need, we need more help. <laughs> we need more people because there's a lot, a lot of demand. So something else, something I heard Andy, you say that helped you sort of um, move over to be a KCS promoter was you were kind of hinting at the challenge of scalability and that as complexity and scale increases, we really need all hands on deck uh, to contribute. And that's where I think um, there's a lot of opportunity in customer success. I'm generalizing a bit here, certainly influenced by my own experience, but I think many customer success manager conversations still kind of happen in that one-to-one -one situation. And they're, maybe they're talking amongst the team, sharing lessons learned and uh, from time to time developing playbooks that they all use, but I don't think there's that real time capture of the knowledge exchange and those one-to-one -one interactions into something that's like a KCS article. And the nature of CSMs being individual people that can only have so many interactions, if you really wanna scale that same type of value across your entire customer base, or even better, maybe scale out onto the internet where non-customers can find what you're talking about. Uh, that's where I think maybe if you're having folks who are resistant to you know, adapting this practice, approaching it from that scalability perspective might be a way to get them there. Like, similar I, I, have a, a, I was the, gonna say, I've, I've attracted um, a kind of technique called KCS by stealth, um, which I've, I've done a few times where it kind of offsets the fear that technical writers have and offsets the stakeholders from that fear of, oh my God, how are we going to train and roll out fallout to people? Um, so in SAP Concur, when I rolled out the KCS program there, we had a stakeholder that had seen it work. So it wasn't really a problem getting them on board. With IFS, I've tried it from a slightly different angle. And by way of introducing KCS by stealth and almost proving that it works really well, I've been able to create templates for R&D for deprecation and also for them to get the message out there and offer to take the effort of way of making sure that the communication cascade works well. Um, and just this week, um, we've been able to also create essentially a promotional position within the support organization of subject matter experts. Little do they know that these people are knowledge domain experts um, that I've just called something different. Um, but basically for support, it now it was negotiation and saying, well, we have this gap. If we create this kind of profile of the person, these people are highly technical. They'll be into documentation. They will also help off stem the flow of cases that are going through to R&D. We'll capture stuff at the cutoff. So talking all of the talk that I know to be KCS without ever mentioning the name, um, not only did it create this role, this new role that we have within the organization, which is great for our people, but it's also got some really tangible, I mean, I'm starting the official rollout of KCS next month, but we've been doing it already a year. We have over a thousand articles already in the knowledge base. I have the success guys on board already producing all of the documentation. I've created a place that addresses certain types of audiences. All the pieces have got in place, it's just no one knew they were doing it. And that's KCS and stealth. I, that's like sneaking spinach right into the pasta sauce. <laughs> I love that, man. Like, yeah. <laughs> Well, that's what I know uh, a couple of our member companies are doing things like that by trying to not go in. I posted a little bit in the chat, but if, as soon as they go into an organization like sales and say, there's some KCS best practices, oh, that's that thing support does. I don't want to hear about it. <clears throat> Talk about how do we capture the information that your sales team has so they can reuse it to sell more. They go, well, that sounds like a great idea. So definitely is a thing. And I think back on kind of some of Sarah's point, I think one of the challenges we still face, and it's a big part of the predictive customer engagement, how we engage customers is getting the information that somebody needs when they need it and not overwhelming them with all this information they don't need. So how do you, and not just make it so they have to search for it, but if I'm a customer success manager and I'm helping a customer through a life cycle, how do I make it easy for that person to consume the information they need without it being a burden to go search for it, without it being a burden of overwhelming me with information, more emails, more training material that I don't use. So how do you get stuff at the right moment of time in people's hands? And it, that's still, I, I 
believe a huge challenge across the industry, especially with the explosion of data. We're making more and more information available at every moment of the day. How do I sift through that to the stuff I really need? Yeah, that, uh, this is Stefan. So I fully agree with you, right? And um, and um, the the customer success management teams that I've uh, helped or that I've talked to, they they are really suffering from that. Like not even talking about how customers get access to the information, but how customer success managers get access to the information within the company to start with, right? And uh, so that's probably the first that that's, that's the low hanging fruit. Uh, for us, right, to help customer success managers to know where the information lives and and um, and more and more, uh, as you said, with the uh, you know the the fact that the quantity of data is just like exploding, um, the technology that we use, whether it's t Microsoft Teams or uh, whatever else, right, is making making it so easy to uh, duplicate the information or share it like in a very convenient way that becomes private to these particular teams or that becomes like uh, uh, buried under tons of other posts and what have you makes it even harder. So I think uh, the conversation between as well, how we use the technology that we that we have available in, in the companies between places where we can chat, places where we can uh, capture what we know, so the experience base, right? Uh, KCS mm -hmm. by stealth, as Claudia said, for these organizations as well as uh, where do we actually uh, manage the content that is going to be reused by others and needs to be maintained is, uh, is probably like a good starting point as well, a good discussion to have for, for organizations like CSMs. Yeah, it's a good point. And I know Stefan did some work on professional services using some of KCS methodologies for reusing pieces of work that professional services is doing. So there's, I think, lots of areas that we could use these concepts and best practices without having to talk about the case and the interaction, but changing some of that language to make it more universal. And, you know, again, you can use your analytics to, to track some of this as well. I mean, if you apply some machine learning to uh, the uh, session logins by company and what they do and, and what sequence of articles and other content documentation that they open and at what stage of their uh, uh, life cycle that they're accessing this content. This is all within the realms of, of machine learning now. And uh, so applying something like that would be very beneficial, I think. Um, one of the things that, that I was thinking about is the different audiences that we're talking about for customer success content. So obviously customers are an audience there, but um, you know, the, the different um, internal teams that need the information as well. So we, you know, obviously the engineers and product team know how the product's supposed to work. The support team knows how it breaks and the success team knows how customers actually use the product in real, in, in the real world. And so the success team has a wealth of information that can be leveraged by different departments. And so when we're talking about, you know, capturing content, structuring it and making it available, you know, all, another layer of that is to whom and how can you create a structure for different types of content for different audiences? It's an interesting layer there. Cause you know, for me, um, you know, I've, I've worked in different roles in the organization, but currently I'm in product marketing where part of my role is researching our buyers and understanding what, what makes our customers want to use us and who is more in tune to the customer experience than customer success. So if I could tap into that information, it'd be hugely beneficial to me and our sales team and you know whoever else is needing that information. So I think that's just another layer to, to think about when you know all these different pieces fit together with the content types and the structure and the audience and technology. Um, it's a lot to think about, but yeah, that internal audience is important to consider too. And I think that may also, and sorry, I'm kind of going on a tangent here, but it may also impact how you prioritize, you know, in the organization. So maybe if there is a need from, uh, maybe the sales team isn't getting, the content isn't good enough for the sales team, you know, maybe having them, uh, 
product marketing, getting more uh, customer related information could improve the sales content. Sales team is happier. Maybe the CRO can really drive the, the, um, drive the plan. I don't know, just, just some, some thoughts there. Well, and I think there's a couple of things you said just made me realize again, like a selling point for how uh, success teams, why it would be worth their effort to sort of adjust how they're capturing knowledge is um, again, like scalability and like you said, data insights for prioritizing. So you want that information from a CSM. Sure, you could book a one-on-one -on -one hour session with the you know top performing CSM and pick their brain, so to speak, and get that knowledge. But if all of the CSMs are capturing information in a similar structure, in a more systematic way that, A, you don't have to book one-on-one -on -one time. You can go like check out the repository and organization-wide, there's data on actual which topics um, are more meaningful to folks rather than just what people, cause you know, there's probably a lot of bias involved in what we think is the most important stuff. And if we actually have data around success content usage, we might be surprised. I, I was just thinking about, you know, bias as identified by who's yelling the loudest, right? Like, they, like, <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that was Claudia that said that earlier in terms of, do we have data or is someone just yelling or really focused on their own <laughs> perspective about what's happening? Yeah, we probably conflate those uh, more often than we realize. Yeah, well, because, you know, it was just Travesti, I was just thinking about what Bunny was saying, and also linking it back to the sort of AI stuff. So one of the, the pieces that I'm working in, and any um, someone in here has probably either worked for Caveo or knows of them, but one of the, the pieces that I often feel always na is a natural complement to any KCS implementation to, in order to make it successful is a unified search functionality. And a unified search functionality that has that, that AI built in behind it so that you can start understanding and pinpointing the usage and demand and whether things aren't being fulfilled or aren't being seen. Even with regards to sort of, I'm as transparent as possible because I even feel like if this article is seen by an audience that wouldn't necessarily leverage it, it still feeds into that value model. So it still makes me see that the people that are producing this content are experts. So even with the knowledge articles, I only ever have one template. And then on that, I have the different fields for the different areas. And there will be specific instructions for the different people so that they'll always stem back to a customer question because everything eventually, the whole reason for being, this falls back into the voice of the customer and customer experience, but we are there to serve our customers. So everything links back eventually to something that is grounded in the customer. And then all of the content that flows underneath that falls as an arch and, and will flow off that so it really doesn't matter I always think of it doesn't really matter what kind of audience is coming in where we should be able to with AI and be able to with unified search know that the customer be that internal or partner or marketing or sales or whatever we want to call ourselves we know the person that is looking for the service we understand them and then we can leverage the content that we have successfully recognized and organized through KCS as our methodology to be able to serve them and then back end take the outcomes of those search interactions and pinpoint the areas where we have gaps. So if the salespeople then don't go on to use that, is there a feedback loop for that? Does it feed into the voice of the, voice of the employee program or whatever we want to call it? Are we able to capture and quantify and join the dots between all of the data that we have to create those business cases to then go and approach it from a different way and feed back into marketing, feed back into sales, understand from professional services, which by the way, have been rather challenging in their conversations because they're always in the field apparently and never have time to write anything. Um, but yeah, so, so feed back into these organizations and help them understand why, you know, technical writers aren't the be all and end all of an organization in terms of being able to sell the stuff that we've got and show that as the, as the, as the leverage to, to make more sales. And with that glorious vision of the future in our heads, we have reached the top of the hour. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. This has been a wonderful conversation. It's been great to see you all. Um, we'll have a recording that we'll email out um, to the folks who registered. And it seems like maybe this might be a topic that we should continue to pursue. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. Great. Bye.